Hey, what's up, guys? So this is my lecture for CSCS Chapter 1, Structure and Function of Body Systems. Please note that all the content shared in this lecture is straight from the book, Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, written by NSCA. So if you have any additional questions, please refer back to the book, or you can leave your question in the comment section down below, and I'll be happy to answer that. All right, so with that said, let's dive right in. Um, so we start with the musculoskeletal system. Our skeleton is made up of axial and appendicular skeleton. So our axial skeleton is our skull, our sternum, um, our vertebral column, which is our spine, and then our ribs. Okay, so whatever is in the center of our body is our axial skeleton. Everything else, like our arm, our leg, our hip, shoulder everything else is appendicular skeleton okay just the basics um, there's different joints described in the textbook fibers cartilaginous and synovial so fibrous joints are typically made up of bones that don't really move that much like our skull is a good example of a fibrous joint um, there's also cartilaginous joints um, these guys have limited movements and our disc um, between our vertebral bodies is another good example of cartilaginous joints. And then there's the synovial joints, which are your typical um, ortho joints that move much, much more compared to the two types of joints that we talked about already. And synovial joints are your elbow and your knee, okay? So there's good amount of movement happening in those joints. All right, so moving on to skeletal musculature, there's three different layers. That makes up our muscle eventually and the most outer layer is called the epimesium okay so epimesium is right here and then the next layer is going to be perimesium which is right here and then the final the most inner layer out of um, these three is the endomesium so at this point um, we just have to memorize the order here um, what worked for me was I just took the very beginnings of these words, epi, peri, and endo, and I kept repeating that, epi, peri, endo, and it worked for me. I don't know if it'll work for you, but you can definitely give that a try, epi, peri, endo. Epi, peri, endo is kind of, uh, it kind of sticks after a while. And so, um, epimesium, like we talked about, is the most outer layer, and then the perimesium, uh, which is in the middle, is what covers the fasciculus okay so fasciculus is covered by perimesium and finally the endomesium is the most inner layer and that's what surrounds or covers the individual fibers okay all right so moving on to neuromuscular junction we're just going to go back to this diagram um if you remember my fibril here um this is what makes up our muscle fiber okay so our myofibril bunch of myofibrils makes up muscle fiber all right and so myofibril itself is made up of actin and myosin okay so actin those are our thin filaments all right thin filaments and then myosin those are our thick filaments. Um, it's important to note here that sarcomere is our smallest contractile unit made up of actin and myosin, okay? And within the sarcomere, there are these things, all right? So now that we know that and we've established that, let's dive a little deeper into what all these mean, okay? So A-band is alignment of myosin filaments okay so myosin a band all right and then actin is i band okay um one way to remember this actin although it starts with an a it doesn't align with a it goes with i so i just go a i and then m a okay so a i m a a's don't go together here all right so that's one way to think about it um z line or z disc um which is referred to as z line sometimes is in between i band all right so wherever actin is 
That's where the I band is, and in the middle of the I band is where Z disk is, or Z line. All right, and then H zone is pretty much what Z disk is to act in, except H zone is in the middle of A band. All right, and that's where myosin, only myosin exists. So that's pretty much it. Um, uh, let's talk about sarcoplasmic reticulum real quick. Um, sarcoplasmic reticulum is what surrounds each myofibril. So if we go back to here, um, we talked about myofibril. Myofibril is surrounded by sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, so sliding filament theory literally means that actin and actin is gonna slide towards myosin, all right? And so actin filaments at the end of sarcomere, like we talked about, actin and actin at the end of sarcomere, slide in on myosin filaments, okay? And what is that gonna do? That's gonna decrease H zone and I band, all right? So we talked about H zone in the middle of A band, and then we also talked about I band, which makes up, or what is made up of actin, right? So as the muscle shrinks, of course these zones are gonna shrink because everything shrinks. So remember, sliding filament theory, actin slides towards myosin, and all the zones essentially shrink. All right, so now that we've established what it is, it is made up of five different phases, okay? So let's go over each of them. Resting phase, um, there's little calcium present in myofibril, and in order for all this to happen, we need calcium, okay? And so in the resting phase, there is no calcium, so none of this can happen. Now moving on to excitation contraction coupling phase. Before myosin cross bridges can flex, they must first attach to actin filaments. And so even though actin moves towards myosin, if myosin doesn't attach to actin, this can't, none of this can happen, okay? So that's the first step in excitation contraction coupling phase. And when sarcoplasmic reticulum is stimulated to release calcium, like we talked about, right? Calcium binds with troponin, okay? So that's an important word to remember. Calcium binds to troponin, all right? And then there's also tropomyosin. I'm gonna write that down here, tropomyosin. And so calcium binding to troponin causes tropomyosin to move, okay? And so now myosin cross bridges attach more rapidly to actin filaments. So basically, the most important thing to remember is calcium binds with troponin and that causes tropomyosin to move, which makes myosin and actin bind closer together. All right, so that's stage number two. Stage number three, contraction phase. Um, energy for pulling action, which is called power stroke, comes from hydrolysis, okay? So the energy for this comes from hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and phosphate. And we're gonna go into detail about this later, but just for now, just remember contraction, power stroke, energy, for power stroke, which is essentially contraction, comes from hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and phosphate. All right, moving on to the recharge phase. Um, contraction can occur over and over again as long as these two things are available, and those two things are calcium, um, calcium and ATP. Okay, so as long as those two things are available, um, our cell can recharge and this can happen over and over again. Final stage is going to be relaxation and this occurs when stimulation of motor nerve stops. So all of this just stops and that is relaxation. Okay, so that's all it is. All right, so moving on to neuromuscular system, let's talk about activation of muscles and what action potential has to do with that. The action potential itself is not capable of directly exciting muscle fibers, okay? They're just gonna be traveling along the nerve terminal, and what it does is it causes the release of acetylcholine, okay? And that's what diffuses across 
the neuromuscular junction and causes um, the sarcolemma to be excited and causes the contraction of the muscle. Okay, so that's one thing to remember. Another thing to remember is all or non principle. All right, so all or non principle is motor neuron stimulus causes all fibers to contract. So if there's motor neuron stimulus, all fibers contract and stronger action potential does not necessarily mean stronger contraction okay so it's all or none they either all contract or none of them contract all right next we have muscle fiber types here we have type 1 type 2a and type 2x just think of type 2x as one end of the extreme and then type 1 as the other end of the extreme and type 2a is closer to type 2x but not at this extreme okay and what differentiates these three guys is how efficient they can be for a long period of time let's talk about the fiber types here um, we have type 1 type 2a and type 2x okay so type 1 muscle fibers tend to be smaller in size while type 2 muscle fibers are larger all right but recruitment threshold so when there is an actual potential Type 1 fibers tend to be recruited first, okay, so they have low threshold, and then type 2 muscle fibers have higher threshold, meaning you need a bigger action potential to be recruiting type 2 muscle fibers. Nerve conduction velocity, type 1, slower, type 2, or faster. Contraction speed, um, similarly, they have slower contraction speed as well as relaxation speed okay so everything tends to be slower here um, although it's um, always on right so these are our postural muscles we use type 1 muscle fibers to stay upright um, sit upright while type 2 we rarely use them um, during our everyday activities okay so remember that Fatigue resistance, in order for them to be active all the time, they got to be fatigue uh, fatigue um, resistance, right? So they got to have high fatigue resistance, and then type 2, they have low. We can only use them for a certain amount of time, and they get tired. Uh, that's what this means, high endurance, low endurance. Force output, or sorry, force production and power output. Like I said, we don't use type 2 muscle fibers every day. Um, during everyday activities but when we do we use them for very powerful things all right um, so they have a very high force production and power output um, aerobic enzyme content and anaerobic we're gonna discuss this in later chapters but aerobic basically means oxidative and so type 1 like I said higher endurance um, higher oxidative capabilities and so higher aerobic enzyme content okay and aerobic has to do more with power and strength and so type 2 has higher um, anaerobic enzyme content okay um, sarcoplasmic reticulum complexity um, type 1 has lower type 2 has higher um, capillary density and mitochondrial size also myoglobin content kind of go hand in hand um, like I said, more oxygen in type 1, so just remember, high, 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 okay? Everything that has to do with oxygen and making the diffusion more efficient um, is type 1, all right? And then type 2 is the opposite. Fiber diameter, like we talked about earlier here, um, motor neuron size is small, and so fiber diameter is also small. Um, color, red, and white. All right, type 2A is in the middle, but leans more towards type 2X. So it's white and red in color. All right, so now applying this concept that we just talked about um, to different sports here. Um, let's look at 100 meter sprint first. 100 meter sprint does not last a long time. They go by very fast. And so we use more of our type 2 muscle fiber than type one, okay? As opposed to a marathon, which lasts a very long time compared to a 100 meter sprint, we use much, much more of type one muscle fiber than type two, okay? So longer the exercise or sports lasts, the more likely that we're gonna be using type one 
as opposed to type 2, all right? Um, but there are some exceptions here, like boxing. Boxing, you need to be going the distance, but also at the same time, got to be strong and quick. So strong and quick is type 2. Um, going the distance, endurance is type 1, right? So uh, for boxing, it's both high, all right? Um, same thing with speed skating, they're both high. So um, just knowing these principles and applying them is going to be very important. All right, so moving on to proprioception, it's our sensation to pressure and tension, and they process information at a subconscious level, okay? So very important to distinguish between muscle spindles and our Golgi tendon organ. And so here we have the Golgi tendon organ, GTO, here and then we have our muscle spindle here okay so let's talk about the muscle spindle first muscle spindle is what's within our muscle as opposed to gto which is on our tendon okay that's the tendon and this is our muscle that's why it's called intrafusal fiber okay and when it detects um, length change it contracts our muscle Okay, and then GTO is on our tendon, so it's extra fusal, right? It's not in our muscle, it's not within our muscle, so it's extra fusal, and it inhibits muscle activation as opposed to muscle spindle, which facilitates uh, muscle activation. All right, so those are the main two differences there. Moving on to cardiovascular system, this is our heart. A um, couple things to note here left atrium. Um, left ventricle, right ventricle, and right atrium. So our general general blood flow of our body, it goes from the left ventricle, it shoots out to our entire body, okay? And it comes back into our right atrium. So I'm gonna write down here, left ventricle, right atrium, and then it goes to the right ventricle. So ventricles are responsible for shooting blood out, and so, Left ventricle shoots blood out to our entire body, while our right ventricle shoots blood out to our lungs, okay? After it goes through our lungs, it goes to our left atrium. Okay, so we can now quickly talk about the valves. We have AV, which stands for atrioventricular, and then semilunar valves, which are our aortic and pulmonary valves. Moving on to the conduction system. So our conduction system, um, basically is made up of cardiac muscle cells and uh, muscle fibers that are responsible for initiating impulse, okay? So let me see here. So SA node, we start at SA node, okay? And then we go to AV node. So SA node is 60 to 80 beats per minute, um, the highest amount of beats. Then AV node, AV node. And then it goes to AV bundle, left bundle branch, right bundle branch, and Purkinje fibers, okay? So that's just the general order of our conduction system. Um, and then let's go to electrocardiogram. Um, we have PQRST, okay? So we have number one, P, wave, QRS, complex, and T wave, okay? So our P wave is atrial depolarization, all right? And then QRS complex is ventricular depolarization and T wave is atrial repolarization, okay? So we don't have to go into too much detail there, just remember those three, all right? Blood vessels, uh, we have arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries are what carries the blood from the heart, okay? Veins they do the opposite, they carry the blood towards the heart, and the capillaries, what they do is they facilitate exchange between arteries and veins. All right, our final slide for the day, respiratory system. Um, this is a very simple image of our lung. You can see the larynx, the trachea, and then we have the bronchus, the left bronchus, right bronchus, and then it goes into bronchioles and finally the alveoli. How does exchange of air happen? Um, the lungs expand and recoil, right? And then we also have the diaphragm that contracts and um, relaxes. And so that's how we normally breathe. But in terms of heavy breathing, those elastic forces may not be enough. 
And so that's when you might have to use accessory muscles. Um, pleural pressure is pressure in the airspace between lung pleura and the chest wall, and it usually stays negative. And we also have the alveolar pressure here. Um, alveolar pressure is pressure inside the alveoli. Okay, and so in inspiration, the pressure has got to be negative in order to bring stuff in. If the pressure is above um, the atmospheric pressure, then we have no room to bring stuff in. But if it's negative, we do have room to bring stuff in, bring air in, right? So it's negative when we're inhaling or before we inhale, and as we're exhaling, the alveolar pressure, the pressure inside the alveoli is going to be positive or above the atmospheric pressure.